Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered unto them, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Thank you for this opportunity to come before you on this Sabbath morning. As you get ready to open up your world and study the Sabbath lesson, I pray for a blessing upon each and every one of us. We ask for clear understanding, and we pray that you will be with the hope. We pray that all your wisdom and your Holy Spirit may be with each and every one of us. Help us, guide us into your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, and you may. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, this is our second Sabbath going through the um, pamphlet on the Ten Virgin Parable that you will find on the Hohen Research Library site. Um, we are on Lesson 2. These are, were made to be Sabbath school lessons back in 58 when questions on doctrines came out and the church was stepping away from the foundational truths of Adventism and going into the ecumenical beliefs. And so there were a faithful few back then in 1958, 1960, who said, we need something besides the errors that are being propounded in the Sabbath school lessons of the church. So they put together this lesson study, and I'm very grateful for this one because Ellen White says she was often referred to the Ten Virgin Parable and how it relates to Adventists at the close of probation, the, the end of time, which definitely were much nearer then to that th now than they were then in 1958 or even in Ellen White's day. So lesson number two, page four. Um, since we have learned from the previous lesson, and I just have to interrupt myself to say we forgot to plug in a cord last week, and so none of the comments could be heard. And it's taken us this week to, um, to somehow patch up what's missing, and um, we've gotten that done um, Last week's lesson, it's not online yet, but it will be. But it is missing the comments because our cord was not plugged directly into our our um, camera. So um, prayerfully this week, we have all the technical difficulties taken care of. And we will be able to hear the comments that are made. 
So last week's lesson, it says number one here, since we have learned from the previous lesson that the wise understood the truth for themselves and the foolish depended upon the faith of their brethren, is it wise or is it foolish to depend on the teachers of seventh, the teachings of Seventh Day Adventists? And she, it says here, the, the answer is self-evident. We have just learned that to be wise, we must have a thorough understanding of the truth for ourselves. And this goes along with 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Study to show thy neighbor approved unto God. No? No. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. When I engage other people in conversation, and I've done this most of my life, when I worked in a nursing home, etc., I was always trying to glean information from the elderly because they'd lived a long time. And often I would ask, um, do you know Christ? What, what, is, what do you believe? And um, so many times, many people told me, well, I don't know. I would have to ask my minister or my priest or my <laughs> my rabbi. And uh, when we first moved to Tennessee, I had an Orthodox neighbor. And I've always wanted to understand what the Orthodox really believed. So I started plying her with questions. And about the third time, she said, can you quit it? I don't have a clue what Orthodox, uh, Orthodox believe. And I said, but I thought you were one. Yes, I am. I was born one. So that's what I am. So this is where most of the people of the world today are. They believe what they believe. What They don't know what they believe because they were born in it, and that's just what they think they are. So we have to... Sp- Molly? Yes. Um, I have a good example for that. My son and his wife now... Um, he was raised in Adventist, and he's been going to church with his new wife. So I asked them, what do they believe? You know, it's like, okay, Stephen, um, you've gone from the Sabbath and stuff. What do you believe? Well, I'm not sure. Let me ask Melissa, his wife. And she goes, well, I was raised in it, but... I really don't know. I said, Stephen, what about the state of the dead? I didn't dare touch the Sabbath. Yeah. So I asked him, what about the state of the dead? And he goes, Mom, I don't know. I said, so ask Melissa what you guys are supposed to believe. And she goes, uh, Mom, I don't know. So mm. you're right. They don't even know what they believe. And, you know, we can't go over a doctrine just once and say, boy, I got that down pat. I know it. Because I was raised in a home where we lived in a rainy part of the country and a lot on Sabbaths in the fall, winter, and spring when it was raining. Um, my father would read to us out of the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. And he would go over doctrine and went over. And he toted us to every series of meetings there was. And if any set of kids should have been soaked in what their church believed it should have been us but i was amazed that one of my siblings who stepped away from the church was never never really knew the lord i don't think um stepped away from the church and began to live a very worldly lifestyle um i asked him at one point about something and he said what are you talking about and i said we memorized these verses as children and he said we did i don't remember those and he had only been out like six years at that time so that really shook me up because we'd been homeschooled and and had to memorize hundreds if not a thousand or more verses in the scriptures yet they were all gone so when we go to the word it's like refreshing it's new and it's not a dead letter it needs to be um, gone over again and again because we need to remember these things So the second question here is, will not Seventh-day Adventist ministers guide us safely? 
And she refers us to, this is in saying she, this is talking about Anna here. She's the one that put these lessons together. Um, and Testimonies to Ministers 409 says, Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. If doubts and unbelief are cherished, the faithful ministers will be removed from the people who think they know so much. If thou hadst known, said Christ, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. So we must have a knowledge for ourselves. Why? Because the majority have always been wrong. If we turn over to Spirit of Prophecy, uh, Volume 4, page 214. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 214. Somebody want to read that first full paragraph that begins, In Every Age. Do I have a reader? 4SP 214. In Every Age. You getting it? Dave. Okay. Okay. I'll read. In, in every age, okay. God has called his servants to lift up their voices against the prevailing errors and sins of the multitude. Noah, Noah was called to stand alone to warn the anti Delivian world. Moses and Aaron were alone against kings, king and princesses, magicians and wise men, and the multitude of Egypt. Elijah was alone when he testified against the apostate king and a backsliding people. Daniel and his fellow stood, fellows stood against, alone against the decrees of mighty monarchs. The majority are always to be found, usually, usually to be found on the side of error and falsehood. The fact that doctors of divinity have the world on their side does not prove them to be on the side of truth and of God. The wide gate and the broad road attract the multitude, while the straight gate and the narrow way are sought only by the few. Did you get that? That's talking about all through the 6,000 years of this earth's history, the majority are always usually it says usually to be found on the side of error and falsehood so that, if, if you're surrounded with, with people Jeremiah 315 excuse me this is I didn't have testimonies to ministers so I started looking things up and I found Jeremiah 315 you want to read that for us sister oh I'm sorry I don't have it right here with me Okay, I'm three fifteen. I will right give now. you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's the Lord as He's trying to gather up the the scattered flock. Um, he will do things in His own way because the theological teachers of today are infidels. Um, Sister Ree, you have your Spirit of Prophecy, Volume Four. I heard you say, "I'll read just before Brother." Dave started reading. Could you go to 220 and read for us? Um, see the dot, dot, dots down in the uh, lower part of the page? Yes. Um, just below that, I have been... Uh, let's see. No, maybe not. It, just above that, it is true, but not wonderful. Can you read the rest okay. of that there, that paragraph? Mm -hmm. Down to um, theological is. teachers are infidels. Down to what? I'll stop you when you get there. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. It is true but not wonderful when we become acquainted with the state and corruption of the present age that I have met with great opposition from the pulpit and professed religious press, and I have been instrumental through the preaching of the Advent doctrine of making it quite manifest that not a few of our theological teachers are infidels in disguise. Ugh. So this was I Miller's day. What's that? What's that? This was William Miller. 
writing this. So he had the same difficulty Noah had. He found that the religious teachers were infidels in his day. And this is the way it's been through all of history. So like we read last um, last week, the foolish depend on somebody else to take and do their their study for them, their research for them. But the wise will understand, and they'll they'll take it up and run with it. Yes, Mark? Um, Review and Herald, May 3, 1887, um, right in the middle of paragraph 2, it says, In order for us to give a reason of the hope that is within us, we must first have an understanding of the truth ourselves. The time has come when we cannot depend upon the doctrine which comes to our ears unless we see that it harmonizes with the word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That's one I hadn't found this week. That's great. So now is the time for us to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So. Let's turn to the Word of God, because it talked about doctrine here. Um, Well, actually, we need to go down through these first. Um, We know now that it's not going to be uh, safe to listen to Adventist ministers to guide us, because many will stand in the pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, like we just read out of TM. But what will they be worshiping? Baal, Baal is the choice. The religion of many among us will be the religion of apostate Israel. Do you know what Baal was called when, uh, and I, I don't have this reference with me, uh, with me, but you can look it up. What Baal was called on Mount Carmel when Elijah said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. And if Baal serve him. You know what the Israelites were calling Baal? Yahweh. It's the name for Baal. The, the, the Phoenician God. So we have this same thing going around today. Look what Jesus said. Let's turn to Matthew 16. 11, or verse 6. Matthew 16 verse 6. Somebody want to read that, please? Matthew 16, 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So who were the Pharisees in Christ's day? Jews. They were the conservative Jewish leaders, the conservative class. Who were the Sadducees? They, they the theologians. Were, thank you. They were they were the theologians, Sadducees. but they were more liberal. They had a lot of teachings that were just simply tradition. They didn't stand on the word of God like the Pharisees said they did. Although none of them, none of them kept the law of God. They all went with traditions one way or the the other. So Jesus here is warning, take heed, beware, beware of their doctrine. Okay, let's look at verses 11 and 12 as well. Do I have a reader? Sixteen verses 11 and 12. Correct. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understand they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So question. It is stated over and over in this day and age that doctrine doesn't matter, 
We just need to unify. We'll all come together upstairs understanding the doctrine. But if that was truth, how come Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders in Seventh-day Adventism of his day? If it was not important, why would Jesus have given a warning to his disciples that was written down and is for our admonition today upon whom the ends of the world come? See, doctrine is important. We have to know the difference between the doctrine of Christ and the doctrines of devils. We have to understand these things for ourselves. Let's now look at Luke 12, 1. Luke 12, verse 1. Do I have a reader? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Tracy. (laughs) Hi, Tracy. Go ahead and read, dear. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So he never changed his tune, did he? Even when a large group of people came to see him, His first admonition was beware, beware of the doctrine of the ministers and the leaders, the conference leaders. This was his warning. Now let's look at Colossians 2, 8, Colossians 2, verse 8. This is usually what men stand on. So let's read Colossians 2, verse 8. Do I have a reader? Beware lest lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Thank you. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That's what that man said to me in in trail. I studied philosophy, and I said, I don't believe in it. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Philosophy is... Highfalutin mental spiritualism. <laughs> and that's what the colleges are run on. And we're Greek philosophy. That's what Luther said. He said, many will be lost, will be sent to hell through the door of the universities. Because of the Greek philosophy that was being taught in his day, in his day, long time ago. So here we have an admonition, beware lest any man spoil you. Not just the the conference leaders or the ministers or the teachers, but anybody, no matter who it be, be careful. Be careful. Because it'll take us away from the doctrines of Christ. So, again we ask, does doctrine matter? Somebody want to read number four there in our um, book. Number four, the quote um, from FCE. I actually looked it up in series A. Fundamentals Christian Education. Yeah, 331. Well, let me go ahead and read it from series A, number two, page 118. It says, the religion of many among us. Among us, this is not talking about the world. This is talking about within the church. The religion of many among us will be the religion of apostate Israel because they love their own way and forsake the way of the Lord. The true religion, the only religion of the Bible that teaches forgiveness only through the merits of a crucified and risen Savior that advocates righteousness by the faith of the Son of God has been slighted spoken against, ridiculed, and rejected. 
So that's our majority today, an unsafe lot to be among. What page was that on? Uh, 118. That's Series A, number 2, page 118. And it's near the bottom of that page. You're welcome. Okay, so why is it so important that we study to know what doctrine we should hang on to? Let's find, let's go to our Bibles and find a biblical answer for this. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 2. Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. Do I have a reader? Amen. Keep reading, brother. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain drop upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Thank you, brother, brother Ed. Thank you so much. This is very, very important. Because we're living in a time where Peter tells us to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what is the Spirit? He's the Spirit of truth. So if we're holding on to the doctrines and traditions of, of devils and men, is the Holy Spirit going to be able to infill us? No, because He's the Spirit of truth. So here, like Brother Ed just read, Christ tells us, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Have we ever heard of something called the latter rain? It's founded on proper doctrine. We have to study for ourselves to know the doctrines of Christ in order to have that latter rain poured upon us. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. It's not some euphoric feeling where you run around and, Oh, Jesus lives in me. He lives in me. You might not be able to see it, but he lives in here. No, it's not about feeling. It's about being grounded and embedded in the truth. And living the truth, obeying the truth. Okay, let's turn to Proverbs 4, verse 2. Proverbs 4, verse 2 tells us what doctrine is. Proverbs 4, verse 2. Do I have a reader? For I, for I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. So, what is good doctrine? The commandments, the law of God, following the law of God. You know, this is what Luther taught. He said, away from the pilgrimages to Rome, away from all of that. If, If ever there was a city built above hell, it's Rome. You're not going to find God there. Quit doing these pilgrimages and all of these beatings and flagging of yourself and, and going about with nails in your shoes for penance. He says, get away from all these works of the flesh and follow the law of God. My doctrine shall come down as the showers, the law of God. Who will God give good doctrine to? Isaiah 28, 9. Isaiah 28, 9 gives us the answer. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Do I have a reader? Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Go ahead and read 10 as well, please. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Amen. So precept... And we should link that with... Go ahead. We should link that with Hebrews 5.14. Okay. Which tells us 
who's who's ready for food and who needs milk. Hebrews five verse fourteen. Okay. Let's see if I can find it here. Me belongs to them that are of full age. So those who would be weaned would be of full age. Mm -hmm. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So those who have come to a knowledge of the truth and been skillful in studying the word line upon line, precept upon precept, yes. mm -hmm. word of righteousness then they can handle strong meat. And he goes on to say, I don't think there should have been a chapter break here, but that's okay. So it goes on to say, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. I for years stumbled over that verse until I realized it's saying, look, when you were justified and you came to Christ and you said, I did this and this and this and this and this wrong when I was not in you please forgive me we don't have to go over that list every day we just accept by faith i asked forgiveness for that years ago now i need to grow up into christ and stop stumbling over not believing he's not forgiven me for my past so this is what okay. he's saying let's leave this principle of of coming that that we had when we came to christ saying here i am dirty filthy clean me up and let's build on that foundation that we've been justified and made right with God. And for Jesus' sake, he forgives us and helps us daily to walk anew in newness of life. Amen. Okay? So, um, doctrine. Here's an interesting verse that just tickled me. Let's look at Jeremiah 10, verse 8. Because... I thought I thought this was quite revealing. I had never seen it in this light before. So, Jeremiah 10, verse 8. Do we have a reader? But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanity. And I read that and thought, wait a minute, what is that talking about? So I looked up stock, and it means a rod of correction. And it calls it a doctrine of vanities. And doctrine here is a different number. The Hebrew number 3256 than most of them. And it means chastisement, reproof, warnings, restraint, instruction, correction, discipline, rebuke. And so doctrine, the doctrines of Christ are all of the above. For his people. But God says here in Jeremiah 10. Israel is so rebellious. They're so in apostasy. I cannot reach them. They're just foolishly running after. All of this garbage. Of all these heathen nations around them. And though I discipline them. It doesn't matter. It's all in vain. <laughs> Because they're still not listening. And indeed they weren't. They had to go under 70 years of captivity. In order to purge out that motley crew that even then came out of, of, of Babylon. And came back with Moses through the wilderness. No, excuse me. This is after. This is after, isn't it? That, that was when they were in Egypt. So here again, they had... They had trouble going back into sin. And in Moses' time, backing up to that, God had the same problem. And many of them had to die. In, all but two died in the wilderness and could not go into the promised land. So here we have Christ all through the Old Testament having the same issue with the chosen nation that he rose up to prepare a people to be the um, expositors of his, his truth. And the ones through whom the promised seed would come. And he says this. They're, they're brutish. They're foolish. The stock or the rod of correction. Is a doctrine of vanity. In other words. I correct them. I correct them. I correct them. 
and it doesn't work. Have you as a parent ever been discouraged with a child who did the same thing over and over when you corrected them? It can be difficult, can't it? So here is our God saying, this people, this people is far, far, their hearts are far from me. Matthew 7, 28. Let's look at Matthew 7, 28. Do I have a reader? And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Thank you. They were astonished at his doctrine. Why do you think they were astonished at his doctrine? So entirely different than the church. It was the truth, and it was being delivered with authority. We'll read that in the next verse but first i want to bring out here that this is um doctrine is 1322 in the greek and it means instruction and teaching so everything jesus said the people were just amazed at christ's doctrine they had never heard anything like it they didn't find that in all of all of israel's teachers matthew 15 9 <clears throat> matthew 15 verse 9 This is why. This is why they were amazed. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Like, don't carry a hanky on the Sabbath, because that's carrying a burden, and that's a sin. That kind of thing. And our next one is um, Mark one twenty two. Mark one twenty two. Do I have a reader? And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So the scribes taught. To- Yes, go ahead. We need to, this is the second time it says that phrase, as one having authority. Yes. And not as the scribes. His authority was that he was using scripture to explain his doctrine. Scripture from the Old Testament. They had doctrines that had come from tradition of this one and that one and this one and that one, but not scripture. And so he had authority behind him of the scriptures. And they'd never heard anything like he was teaching. All they'd heard was this tradition, which is so much like the Laodicean church today. They don't have, oh, they'll misuse the scripture behind it. Honestly, and it's easy to see. But his authority was from scripture. The important thing to remember about doctrine is it defines, it defines for us what we know about God. Amen. So this doctrine that we have, that we want to follow the Ten Commandments, for us, that defines the character of our God. And the other things that we've learned from the testimonies and all the spirit of prophecy and other things that he says in all throughout the Bible, they all make a picture of God as we understand him, as he has revealed himself to men. We base all our understandings on his word. Now, sometimes, that's why, that's why I often pray, forgive me, for my sins of ignorance, because we don't know everything. We're going to study the Bible through eternity. There will be things that we learn that, oh, I didn't know that. But we need to cultivate this attitude that I don't know it, but I'll get in line with your word when you show it to me. And we've done that with many things. Yes. Now, the important thing to remember is people present their God, what they believe, not from the Bible. They don't adhere to the Ten Commandments. It's like saying... Oh, she froze. It's like saying, I heard long ago, oh, those those Protestants down the street, the Lutherans or the congregations, whatever, they believe in the same God that 
They have just a sincere faith, and they're just, well, their faith may be sincere, but it is not the same God's commands and Correct. His instruction. Correct. And that's why doctrine is important, is that we have doctrine based on the Word of God. Because we want a correct view of God. They do not worship the same God. We have to remember that. And if they're following God, if they, if the Holy Spirit's working with them, when they see the Word of God, they will say, oh, I need to consider that. Maybe I need to change or let me study that. And they will change. They will get in line with the Word of God. When they won't get in line with the Word of God, we know they have a different God. Right. We know our God by our doctrine. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Let's turn now to Isaiah 29, 24, because this is a precious promise. If, if we take this personally, this is a promise. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. So God promises, look, even though you've had these stop spots in the past, just keep coming to me and asking, and I will give you good doctrine. You will learn it. Just keep keep at it. Don't give up. So that's what a promise. Bible verse was that? That was Isaiah 29, verse 24. Thank you. God promises to teach us good doctrine. And I like what you say, said, Jane, where you, you ask God to give you insights to what your heart is really like. You know, we need to do that more and more. Ask the Lord, show me my sins of ignorance. Um, like I remember one time um, we lived for 15 years in high desert and we lived <laughs> where we didn't have enough water to grow much. And so I lived without flowers in my yard, except for the occasional wildflowers that that grew there. And um, so when we moved, uh, we were working on a job. And we were at this house, we, we got to this house and they had these huge hydrangea bushes in the yard. And I said to my husband, oh, can I pick some of these? Because this, this house was empty. There was nobody there and we were um, there doing a job. And he said, sure, go ahead. So I picked some flowers and I took them to the car. And my son said, mama, you stole their flowers? And it hadn't even struck me. You know, we go for walks in the woods and we pick all the wildflowers. And I didn't even really think of it. And I'd ask Mark and he said, sure. You know, he didn't think anything of it either. Here's these huge, huge bushes. Who's going to miss a, a handful of hydrangeas, you know? And, um, oh, I felt so bad. And I took it to the Lord and he said, you're being covetous of what's in another man's yard. <laughs> and I realized that's, that's something in my heart. I hadn't realized was there and that has really made me realize we do need to pray that God will will show us our sins of ignorance what's still inside that we're missing that we need to be made aware of because um, we want everything to be right with God don't we so he promises that we shall learn his doctrine and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for his Holy Spirit that teaches us what we are and what we must become in order to be inheritors, inheritors of eternal life. Let's look at Mark 11, verse 18. Mark 11, 18. Do I have a reader? And the scribes and chief priests heard it and thought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. So the leaders became afeared of Christ because everybody was totally amazed at his powerful, powerful teachings that were founded on the word of God. We're going to face the same thing. Um, I'm looking at the time and it's running away so quickly. Um, so I'm going to give you some more verses here that um, you might want to look up. John 7, 16 and 17. John 7, 16 and 17. This one tells us that we need to do God's will in order to understand the doctrine. 
Romans 16, 17 through 19. Romans 16, 17 through 19. 1 Corinthians 14, 6 and 26. Ephesians 4, 14. Ephesians 4, 14. Now let's look at 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 10. And I'll read this real quick. Um, he talks to the Ephesus people and etc. And he says that thou mightest charge some. He's talking to Timothy about these places he's at. That they teach no other doctrine. And what was their doctrine? It was the doctrine that Christ had come and died for man. That the Redeemer had indeed come. And verse 10, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for man stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So sound doctrine will bring us out of these sins that are listed here in First Timothy. Um, now, 1 Timothy 4, 6, 13, and 16. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Then verse... Um, 13 and 16 till I come give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee is doctrine important yes it's very very important and we could go on there's there's many more. I've got six or seven more. Look up the doctrine texts and read through them. Um, if you want more on that subject, we're going to move along here. Um, turning the page to number five in our Ten Virgin Parable. What is written about the wise remnant? Do I have a reader for that answer? This is out of Desire of Ages. In place of the authority of the so-called fathers of the church, God bids us accept the word of the eternal Father. Here alone is truth, unmingled with errors. Let all who accept human authority, the customs of the church, or the traditions of the fathers, take heed to the warning conveyed in the words of Christ. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Desire of Ages 398. Thank you. The customs and traditions were highly valued by the rabbis. Highly valued. And so it is today. But the authority of God is of greater significance. And, and we must follow the Lord. Okay. What wise man do we have as an example to follow? We find this in Desire of Ages, page 140. And 141. 140 and 141. Do I have a reader? Bottom of the page, if Nathaniel. If Nathaniel had trusted to the rabbis for guidance, he would never have found Jesus. While they trust to the guidance of human authority, none will come to a saving knowledge of the truth. Thank you. So with Nathaniel, it was by seeing and judging for himself that he became a disciple of Christ. And so in the case of many today whom prejudice withholds from good, how different would be the result if they would come and see, come and see. Spend time in the Word. Spend time on your knees. And know that Christ 
is the divine son of the living God, and he has the power to help us overcome. Nathaniel, he never would have found Christ had he trusted to the rabbis. Is it wise to tell people to trust in man? The answer is found in 182 of the same book. 182. Do I have a reader for that one? Number seven. Is it wise to tell people the truth in man? The people are taught to rely on man for guidance, and thus they fall into error and are led away from God. Desire of Ages, page 182. So the same danger still exists, and God calls men and women to do a certain work and to carry it forward under his direction and they're to do it we're not to turn around and say to somebody else what do you think should i do this or that we're to go directly to the lord just like john the baptist did and it's interesting you read about john the baptist he separated after the death of his parents he separated himself from his relatives And from the people of Israel, he went out into the wilderness to prepare himself. Excuse me. To prepare himself to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Because he knew he would not get the right instruction from those that he had been raised around. They were too steeped in Seventh-day Adventist tradition of that day. Laodicean tradition. Number eight, is it wise or foolish to trust the leaders in the church? Self-evident, no, it's not. But Desire of Ages, somebody want to read that 206? And the leaders in Israel became instruments of Satan in warring against the Savior. Wow. I've never read that before. Satan planned to work through his human agencies in the religious world by imbuing them with his own enmity against the champion of truth. He would lead them to reject Christ and to make his life as bitter as possible, hoping to discourage him on his mission. Has your life been made bitter by professed Christians because you want to walk and work for God? Don't be discouraged. Look unto Jesus. He's been through this with Laodiceans. They were his greatest grief. His greatest grief. Okay, number nine. Give an example of a betrayed trust that will lead many astray. It has a bunch here. Somebody want to read those? Number nine at the bottom of the page, five. Number nine, give an example of a betrayed trust that will lead men astray. And below it says, the mind of the Pharisees. Christ's Object Lesson, page 156, The Mind of Judas, Early Writings, 165, um, 5T, 690, The Mind of the Romanists of the Dark Ages, The Mind of the Spiritualist, Great Controversy, page 554, The mind of the churches of Babylon and the mind of the heathen of all cults and of all ages is now the mind of the atheist that believes the leaders in the questionable doctrinal book. Page 
But she's I'm right. Sorry, We're hadn't... told many are atheists. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the child of God may properly say with truth, I shall be saved from the very presence and possibility of sin. Thus, we have been saved justification we are being saved sanctification and we shall be saved glorification and that qd is i don't know what that's qd it's questions on doctrines the um the questionable doctrines of adventists written in in 1958 1959 so yeah they have a very interesting twisting turning philosophy here on these two pages that when i read it three times this week i kept saying what in the world are they trying to get at it doesn't make a lot of sense to me so we'll go back to the mind of the pharisee what was the mind of the pharisee christ object lessons it's actually 158 he had a misprint here or something i searched and searched for it before i found back on number nine matt uh page five bottom of page five On Christ Object Lessons 158, it says the Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in self-righteous armor, which the arrows of God, barbed and true aimed by angel hands, failed to penetrate. So what is the mind of a Pharisee? It's self-righteousness. Self-righteousness that angel hands cannot, uh, the barbs of the, the arrows of God barbed and true aimed by angel hands fail to penetrate. So that's the mind of your Pharisee. What was the mind of Judas? What was the mind of Judas? Early writings 165 says this. I was carried down to the time when Jesus ate the Passover supper with his disciples. Satan had deceived Judas and led him to think that he was one of Christ's true disciples, but his heart had ever been carnal. He had seen the mighty works of Jesus. He had been with him through his ministry and had yielded to the overpowering evidence that he was the Messiah. But Judas was close and covetous. He loved money. So what was the mind of Judas? Close and covetous. Close and covetous. His covetous disposition, when rebuked, led him to deny his Savior whom he had spent time with for three and a half years, led him to sell him for a few pieces of silver. What is the mind of... Oh, whoa, I'm missing one. 5T690. The Testimonies, Volume 5, page 690 says, Those who train the mind to seize upon everything which they can use as a peg to hang a doubt upon and suggest these thoughts to other minds will always find occasion to doubt. They will question and criticize everything that arises in the unfolding of truth, criticize the work and position of others, criticize every branch of the work in which they have not themselves a part. So critical once will betray their trust this was the mind of the romanist in the dark ages they they were critis- critical of every reformer that god sent to arouse them from their lethargy and sin um and of the spiritualists this is um, great controversy 11 1911 great controversy 554 
at the bottom of the page, she says, Spiritualism teaches that man is the creature of progression, that it is his destiny from his birth to progress, even to eternity toward the Godhead. And again, each mind will judge itself and not another. The judgment will be right because it is the judgment of self. The throne is within you, said the spiritualistic teacher. As the spiritual consciousness awoke within him, my fellow men all were unfallen demigods. And another declares, any just and perfect being is Christ. Thus in, placing, in place of the righteousness and perfection of the infinite God, the true object of adoration, in place of the perfect righteousness of his law, the true standard of human attainment, Satan has substituted the sinful, erring nature of man himself as the only object of adoration, the only rule of judgment or standard of character. This is progress, not upward, but downward. And it reminded me of the song um, when I was six, 15 or 16 years old. I, I um, had a babysitting job for a lady whose youngest infant of three or four months was actually in intensive care because her mother had thrown her against the wall and fractured her skull. And um, so she was all hooked up to wires. I only saw her once. But I babysat for this lady several times. Um, she had four remaining children or five at home. I forget how many um, little ones, just uh, <laughs> 16 months apart. And... They had, she'd spent some time in prison for her violence, but she was out, but she was not allowed to be alone with her children. So when my dad picked up her husband to take him uh, logging together, he worked for my dad, I was dropped off to remain with this lady to make sure she didn't kill one of the other kids. And it was a very, very interesting and intense situation for a 15-year-old to be in. Well, one Sunday morning, I got there, and um, I'm out feeding the dogs that were in a cage behind the house. And I had just fixed breakfast, and the children were all at the table. And I get in there, and she's on a tirade. And the kids are all scattering from the table, not finishing their food. And long story short, she decided right then and there, we were dropping everything, and she was going to take us to church. Well, she was a Pentecostal lady. So I got to go to church with her that morning. And it was a horrendous experience. Um the Spirit of God was not there. It just made my hair stand on end. They wouldn't let me stay in the children's division, so I had to go in the main sanctuary, and it was speaking in tongues, and she crawled up the aisle and showed off everything she had and got several men in the congregation speaking in tongues and really hyper. And um, during this whole thing, the congregation was swaying back and forth with their hands up and singing uh, majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus be all glory power and praise and so as they sang this song the organist kept taking it louder and higher a next chord up or a next note up net next note up and they kept going faster and faster until i just bolted out of there and fled and went and sat in the car until it was over with and i was so shocked at what i had seen i'd never been in a situation like that before where i felt so overpoweringly in the hands of evil and um, years and years later, when Mark and I decided to give our hearts to the Lord, we came back to a church, and it was one of the large churches in the Walla Walla Valley. And we got in there, and we get in the middle of this huge congregation, and the first song they go to sing is that same song. And I was so shook up by it. I busted up crying and I could not quit bawling because here the church I had been raised in and had was now coming back to was into a song that I was fully aware of where its beginnings had been um, some 20 years before. And so they, they took their ushers and they led me out and um, Mark and the children caught up with me and... Um, I said, that song should not be an Adventism. It should, it's, it's a Pentecostal song. It brings spirits in that, that we, we don't need that. And Mark said, oh, come on, Melanie. It's a really nice song. So we sat down and we started studying it. 
And there's a book written by um, the same author. Matt, they can't hear me. There's a book written by the same author, um, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. And the author of the song says in that book, he wrote this song for the perfection of the saints who begin are beginning to see that worship is not vertical, it's horizontal. You and I are sons and daughters of God, therefore we are gods and we need to worship one another. That's the whole premise that song was written on. And when I read this about the spiritualism coming in and taking over and and men saying they will judge themselves, I think of this and I just want to warn you all that not every song is of God just because it has, quote, nice words. We need to we need to investigate and plead for the help of the Holy Spirit which this lesson is teaching us, we we need the Holy Spirit and His Word to teach us what is right and wrong so that we can be those that need not milk anymore, but we can decide, we can choose the difference between right and wrong because of the, the, the Spirit in our lives. We need to understand these things from above. Um, so... <sighs> have these examples before us of those who trust to their own minds, those who are self-righteous, self-worshippers, covetous, boastful, and filled with themselves. Um, Number 10, what does God say about sanctification? Is it while we are being saved Somebody want to read the um, quote there on number 10. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, but of a lifetime. Thank Acts you. Acts of the Apostles, page 560. It's the work of a lifetime. And it's not doing our own works. It's doing the will of the Father that sent Christ to show us that to keep his father's commandments is the way of righteousness. Let's look at signs of the times. May 23, 1895. And I'm going to read paragraph 6. This is actually under number 11. Will sanctified men say or teach that they are sanctified? It says here, Let none... But let not God be dishonored by the proclamation from human lips declaring, I am sinless, I am holy. Sanctified lips will never give utterance to such presumptuous words. Paul had been caught up to the third heaven. In other words, he had vision, a vision, and had seen and heard things that could not be uttered. And yet his modest statement is, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. Let the angels of heaven write of Paul's victories in fighting the good fight of faith. Faith. Let heaven rejoice in his steadfast trend heavenward, tread heavenward, keeping the prize in view for which he counts every other consideration as dross. Let the angels of heaven rejoice to tell his triumphs. But let Paul utter no vain praise of himself in making a boast of his attainments. Let those who feel inclined to make a high profession of holiness look into the mirror of God's law, which discovers to us the defects of our character. Those who see the far-reaching claims of the law of God, those who realize that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, will not presume to make the boast of sinlessness and venture to declare, I am perfect, I am holy. If we, John says, not separating himself from his brethren, say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So 
signs of the time, May 23, 1895. Look at Job. Let's go to Job 9, 20 and 21. Job 9, 20 and 21. Do I have a reader for this? If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also, excuse me, prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. Wow. Let's turn over to Job chapter 1. Verse 7. No, verse 8. Read that one, Debbie. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So God said Job was perfect, but Job said... I'm not perfect. If I thought I was, I would prove myself perverse. That's the stance that we need to take. We need to surrender to the Lord and through his power, keep the commandments of God and leave it to him and leave it to him to say, he that is just, let him be just still. What is presumption? Presumption is akin to faith. It is presumption to presume on the mercy of God without obedience to the will and requirements of God. Presumption is the world's substitute for faith. What they pass for faith is only feeling. Let's le- look at Hebrews twenty six twenty seven. Ten, excuse me. Hebrews ten twenty six and 27. Do I have a reader? Hebrews 10. 26 and 27. Muted. Or if we sin, we'll see after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. We remain as no more in sacrifice for sin. But I certain, but a certain feel for looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. Thank you. So if we willfully sin... After we've received the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So when the Lord brings something to our understanding, we need to be quickly obedient and not stubborn to follow his will. How can we tell the difference between faith and presumption? Here we come to the very heart and soul of the ten virgin parables because a we cannot tell the difference by ourselves and b we cannot depend on our brethren to tell the difference for us this is why we need both the scriptures or the word of god and an outpouring of the spirit of god to help us we do not go deep enough in our search for truth every soul who believes present truth will be brought where he will be required to give a reason of the hope that is in him. We must be converted men and women. God can teach you more in one moment by his Holy Spirit than you can learn from the great men of the earth. And that's found in Testimonies to Ministers 119 and also Review and Herald, I believe. So today I just want to leave us with the thought that Psalm 118 Verse 9 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. 
Psalm 146, verse 3 says, Put not your trust in princes in the son, or in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. And 2 Samuel 22, 31 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. So what is a buckler? Can I ask for those references again, Melanie, please? Yes, Psalm 118, Testimony verse 9. ministers. Oh, 119. Testimonies to ministers, 119. Okay, then Psalms 146, 6. Uh, 146.3. Psalm 146.3. Psalm 118, 9. And, and Second Samuel 22, 31. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So Can't what is a buckler anymore? It's a type of shield that was worn on the arms to protect you from getting hit, and hit while you held up your big shield. Exactly. It's a type of small shield. And also there were bucklers. I looked it up in the dictionary. There were also bucklers that they buckled on their arms and legs and their whole body. It was a a whole body support and defense. And so this is what God will be to us. He will shield us on every side. He won't leave us exposed to the enemy. He will cover us if we put our trust in him. Are there any comments before we close? There's no armor on the back. Thank you for your studies. You're welcome. You're right, Matt. There is, Fantastic. well, there's no armor on our back because we're not to run. We're not to turn around and run. That will expose us to the foe. Um, and I just turned the page and we're not done with this lesson quickly. <laughs> it is the, it's um, on page seven. It says, it is the office of the Holy Spirit to tell the difference for us as we study the word of God with prayer. This is what we will find. The track of truth lies close beside the track of error, and both tracks may seem to be one to minds which are not worked by the Holy Spirit. And that's series B, number 2, page 52. So before we go to the next section of this Sabbath School quarterly uh, lesson, it may be well to pursue and review what we have found so far. Number one, what is the oil? Character. The Holy Spirit. Rot, yes. Holy it's, Spirit. It is it, combined. It is the power or grace or wisdom of God to distinguish truth and error, and we can only have that through a, 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 the Holy Spirit helping us. So number two, why? The truth saves. The truth alone will develop character, and God is truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. When he comes, he will teach us of what? He will teach us what we are, what we must become, and he will teach us of judgment to come. So <clears throat> we will be guided into all truth if we, if we stick with him. If we're not in the truth, what's wrong? Somehow we're barring entrance to the Holy Spirit being able to come to us and say, no, 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 this is the way, walk ye in it. Okay. So, let Melanie, us, yes. Years ago, I remember hearing, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. We need to let him lead. Amen. I like that. <laughs> That is right. That's good. I had to think about that one a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay. We are right on time. <clears throat> so, praise God for the Ten Virgin Parable that teaches us how to be among the wise and not the foolish. Let us learn these things well so that we may do them and be part of that faithful group that meet around the throne of grace to praise our Redeemer throughout eternity. 
Do I have a volunteer for prayer? I had two at the beginning, so the one of you who didn't do it, can you do it at the end here for us? Let us bow before God our Father and ask his blessing on the second portion of our study today. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Holy Sabbath day. We come before you through Jesus Christ and praise your name for the word that you've given us the word of truth that we were able to study today. We thank you so much for all the manifestations of that truth, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that you've given us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit to teach us that you have taught us today. Thank you for this gift and that we can come together and worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. 